The agenda this week asked what federal conservatives need to do to win and got a glimpse of our cyborg future. The agenda's week in review begins understanding the financialization of the housing market. But let's understand, Benjamin, a bit of how we got here. What role did low interest rates, historically low interest rates for the last many years play in where we're at today? It was basically the main reason why we are seeing what we are seeing, because we know that for the past 20 years, interest rates have been going down and down and down for many, many reasons. Demographics, people are getting older. We look at Japan, interest rates are negative there. Europe, interest rates are negative, and we are very low. So clearly, the demographic story, people getting older, is a main factor. Inflation expectations went down. Therefore, interest rates going down. So that will remain the case. That's not something that will change tomorrow. And therefore, we have to get used to this kind of situation. Now, when interest rates are very low and all those big financial players are, play, are looking for return and the GIC will not do, so what do you do? You look for alternative investment, which is real estate. So real estate has been king over the past 20 years, and it will remain a very attractive investment given low interest rates. So that's how we got there. The demographic story and low interest rates is the main factor. Demand for real estate is rising and rising and rising, and especially in Canada where immigration is so significant in terms of playing a role in the demand equation. So all those forces are here to stay. Going back to the issue of rent, we have to distinguish between affordable housing and housing affordability. Affordable housing is clearly a market failure. People need a place to live, and the government needs to provide this kind of assistance. But I'm talking about some the other part of the equation, namely young families trying to buy a house in Toronto. They simply cannot afford it. And that's why I believe, and we can discuss it maybe, that the next wave of real estate in Toronto, to an extent in Canada, is actually renting as opposed to owning. I think that at 70%, we have reached the peak of home ownership in Canada, and I think that you will see more and more people renting, and we will start changing the way we view renting. Namely, you are 35 years old, you are married, you have two kids, and you are renting, nothing is wrong with you. That's an okay scenario. That will be the case. On that. Uh, yeah, I think lots of people are renting. I don't have any problem. I know that rent. we have a home ownership ideology in North America uh, that sometimes stigmatizes renters as not quite there yet in their in their housing housing uh, career. Uh, I disagree with that. I think renting is fine. However, um, we just see the prices going up and up and up. That $2,400 figure is so high, people can't afford that. And so what we need, I mean, I agree with Benjamin, we need uh, more government investment in housing. We need rent controls. We need to make it so that people can afford to stay, live in the city uh, where they work, raise their families in places that they love. Having said that, Sean, tell me what it is about whatever makes Toronto magic at the moment that it is such a supremely wonderful place, apparently, to invest in real estate. Well, if you look at <clears throat> housing prices historically in Toronto, they've only declined one year in the past 22 years. Uh, so basically, you've seen almost uninterrupted growth in housing prices uh, for almost a full generation. And now we have uh, basically a generation of home buyers that have only seen the value of real estate rise, and they've seen only record low interest rates. So it factors into their psyche that uh, investing in real estate is a, is a very you know, wise decision. Um, and now it's the fact that 70% you know, of all household assets are actually in real estate. Um, we also have seen immigration levels rise above 100,000 a year in the GTA. We have one of the, or, or if not the fastest growing economy in the country. So job creation has been exceptionally strong. Uh, we see immigration coming in and boosting housing demand. To the point that we're seeing uh, demand for rental housing at 20, 25,000 units a year. We're building maybe on a good year between the condo rental stock and the purpose-built rental stock, maybe 10 to 15,000 units a year. So there's 10,000 units a year that we're not getting. So the rental development industry is starting to recognize this, and we're starting to see some progress made on supply. We have about 14 to 15,000 units under construction, which may sound like a lot, but there's 75,000 condos under construction. So it's still a very, very tiny portion of overall housing development. Uh, but one of the things that we noticed happen after uh, the provincial government removed rent control for anything newly built going forward is that we saw a 40% spike in proposals coming in for new purpose-built rental developments. Uh, so now we have close to 60,000 units in the pipeline. Uh, I can tell you from the work that we do on doing market feasibility studies for rental developers, there's probably another 50, 60,000 that's planned ahead of that. 
Um, so we're going to get there eventually. The problem is that a lot of these units are located downtown. Um, the rents are relatively high. But one of the magical things that you see happen when more supply comes into the market is that rents begin to stabilize. And we're starting to see that right now. This year in Toronto, we'll see the highest level of apartment completions that we've seen probably on record. And because most of those condos were bought by investors, they'll go directly into the rental pool. Some of the stats that I'm seeing over the last six months suggest that rents are actually flattening out. And as that happens, you begin to see a filtering effect down to the rest of the marketplace. Uh, North American conservatism for the past half century or so has really been animated by what can be described as fusionism, uh, which is in effect an intellectual and political alliance between libertarians, those who um, place an emphasis on liberty, on the market economy, and traditional conservatives who place a greater emphasis on, um, on in some cases, religious values or traditional values or ultimately communitarianism. And the reason these two forces came together uh, in the middle of the 20th century was um, because they shared a common enemy uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, the Soviet Union communism represented a threat both to liberty and to traditional, uh, a traditional point of view. And fusionism has, for all intents and purposes, been the underlying idea that's held conservatism together in the United States, uh, in the United Kingdom, and in Canada, even if uh, our politicians don't talk in the, in the language of fusionism. I think for a whole host of reasons, as Ginny says, the, um, the arrangement uh, of fusionism uh, is uh, uh, started to show its wear, uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, and a whole host of other factors, including the rise of globalization, um, uh, increasing secularization in our society, uh, and so on, has um, people on both sides of this arrangement asking themselves if it still makes sense, both as an intellectual and, and political framework. That is why there's so much turmoil in the world of conservatism these days. Do you think there is a generally agreed upon understanding of what it means to be a conservative in Canada at this point in the 21st century? No, I don't believe so. And I think the best example of that is that there are a lot of people who are conservative culturally, they have conservative values, they're religious people of various backgrounds. Uh, who do not see themselves in a conservative political party. Um, those, to be a conservative and to be a big C political conservative are not the same thing. And I think that's actually a challenge the party should be taking on, is why is it that if you look at polling data, if you look at uh, what, what priorities and issues animate a lot of Canadians, conservatives should actually have a broader reach than they actually do have. And I think that's because there are a lot of yeah. people who just don't see the conservative party as a vehicle for their own self-interest, whether that's because of discrimination, past prejudice, or simply just an, an unwillingness to speak to people who might have a, come from, into politics from a different angle uh, than what is assumed to be a conservative party member or conservative voter. Mm. So that is a real concern concern that I have because all this, you know, thinking about ideas and reflection and all that, from my view, if it's all about dealing with the same people over and over mm. again, then I'm not interested in that, right? I mean, over a third of Canadians didn't even vote in last year's election. I want to know why. I want to know what those people think. And I want to know if the Conservative Party should have a unique value proposition for that population. But if it's just a matter of debating between these small circles of very, very few Canadians who actually vote in, uh, you know, for a leader of a political party, and then very few Canadians, in some parts of the country at least, who identify with the Conservative Party, if we're only worrying about what those folks are thinking, then I think it's, you, you probably lost a lot, the next election before it even starts. <laughs> Garnet, are, uh, is there a reason why, in your view, there are Conservatives in this country who don't see a place for themselves in the current Conservative Party of Canada? So I think uh, Jamil's comments uh, really hit it out of the park on, on that issue. Um, let, let, let's start by saying, what, what does it mean to be a conservative? For, for me, a conservative value set believes in the importance of strong families, strong communities, and resilient individuals, uh, what David Cameron called the big society, uh, as an alternative to uh, structural government-oriented solutions in all aspects of our lives. But it's not limited government as an end in and of itself. It's it's resilient individuals, strong families, strong communities as the goal, uh, as an alternative uh, to, uh, to believing that changing the structure and the system will address uh, the problems that exist. Canada is a country, I believe, that is made up of, of 
a, a very diverse set of conservatives. You have conservative Francophone Quebecers that want to preserve uh, their culture. Uh, you have uh, conservative uh, immigrant communities that want to uh, preserve the, the, the values that, that animate their lives, family, community, culture. Uh, you have conservative people in Western Canada who are particularly concerned about uh, the identity and the economy of Western Canada. So the, the struggle for different kinds of conservatives who are who are attached to the particularities of their own cultures and traditions is to build a, a unifying uh, political party that includes all of those different uh, particulars. Uh, a sort of a fiscal conservatism um, that might have been popular, uh, frankly, when Paul Martin delivered it in the, in the 1990s, is, is just not um, something that we can take to voters, along with the sort of Christmas tree of the ornaments that speak to all the different um, uh, groups within the party that Garnet talks about, um, cobbling that together is not enough to get to a win, um, and it's not enough to speak to a conservative vision that people um, uh, can get behind in the way that Jamil's describing, trying to actually bring new people into the party who can feel at home. Yeah, some people do. They, they want to change the, the human body. They feel that you know, biological evolution is moving a little too slow. And if we're going to get to this magical future of where we all have jetpacks and we're flying around, <laughs> we need these beginning steps now to know how our bodies incorporate technology long term. And that's sort of where I place myself. I'm helping, you know, future people uh, figure out how long you can have certain types of tech in the body. Hmm. Lee, how about you? What's, in your view, the advisability of I was going to say messing with. I don't know if that's the right word, but let's say uh, trying to uh, trying to have uh, a technological impact on evolution. I mean, I think it's important that we be realistic with ourselves uh, about the technology that we have and the state that it's at right now. You know, um, there's a lot of discussion around like you know what what kinds of things we're putting in our body and uh like how that interacts with us physically uh some people in the community choose to implant larger pieces of technology um you know and when you look at those you can sort of see that uh the technology is not quite there for us yet and of course it's going to um evolve very quickly and like things are going to change but i think we're, we're very far off and the, the tasks that the things that we can put in our bodies can do right now um are are pretty simple and you know prolonged life and changing the course of evolution, these are, these are very big things. And right now, uh, I would say we're, we're at the beginning of something interesting, but, but definitely the beginning. Well, let's go down the road. Um, Rob, my fellow Star Trek nerd. Yes. Do you worry? Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, the next generation laid it out there for us. Borg, the Borg. Yeah. Where we all become just part of a collective because yeah. we've been consumed by technology. Picard you... is tangling with them again. Yes, he is. Well, no. <laughs> uh, I think it's inevitable. Computers started in a giant room in a university, then it went to your desktop, then it went to your lap, then it went to your pocket. Uh, everyone takes it with them into the shower, to bed, uh, to into the bathroom. The into you the know, shower? Maybe not you, but most people I know have the phone caught. It's like, it's almost like it's attached. Come on. But you're still <laughs> using your thumbs. Use your iPhone in the shower? Everybody does, except for you, apparently. No, like, <laughs> a lot of people do. I mean, can we take a quick survey here? But, but whatever. So it's, it's moving towards the body. Uh, hmm. Meanwhile, quantum turbocharged AI is waiting. Uh, and people like Elon Musk believe that you have to get the neural link to keep up. And it, and, and it is a part of evolution. Like, we're, we're so dependent on our smartphones and so integrated with the data now that to keep using your thumbs doesn't make any sense. It's going to come further into the body. Hmm. Isabel, does this change our understanding of what it means to be human? Well, I, uh, I also agree that it's really about transhumanism and posthumanism, right? So transhumanism is the sort of ideology that you, we should be trying to better, better humanity with technology or any kind of um, scientific um, enhancement. And posthumanism is this sort of idea that we've evolved beyond the category human. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'd like to follow Rob's comments about this push for automation, right? Um, with artificial intelligence, really, artificial intelligence to me is as much a technology, um, is as much an ideology as it is a technology, right? It's convincing us that we need to automate all of our processes um, through large corporations that are sort of publicizing the idea that we need to do so. so I don't, I think in some ways we really have to watch that we've been goaded towards some of these ideas to enhance or better ourselves. Goaded by whom? 
Um, well, I think this, I mean, I was talking about AI. I see AI as a sort of a, an imposed race, right? We, we treat it as if it's a race to beat, um, to, to beat uh, other technology, like as a race to get there first, right? We're constantly racing towards an AI future. And uh, that's, um, that's not real. That's, an art, that's imposed on us by, I think, um, publicity, but public, journalists, sorry, uh, <laughs> um, all kind, you know, technology houses, governments that are competing with other governments, right? There, there's this momentum towards getting there, getting to a finish line that doesn't really exist. And that is just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full versions of those conversations, you can always visit our website. That's tvo.org. Our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda or our Twitter feed. That's twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.